Welcome back to this after the break. I know these breaks sometimes are a little too short because they is a great opportunity for networking. It's it's now my pleasure to welcome you back this morning. And um, one of the one of the um, partners that I think of and uh, who we try to collaborate with um, when we're doing some, much of the work and trying to expose what is happening within the system and educate the public, of course, are members of the media. And so we wanted to ensure that there was an opportunity to talk about the importance and the role of the media in influencing public opinion about um, both what happens within the criminal justice system and what should be happening within the criminal justice system. So I'm very, very pleased today that uh, we're joined by um, three women who have done incredible work in this area. Larissa from APTN, Maureen Brosnan from CBC Radio, and Betty Ann Adam for your ver from your very own um, star Saskatoon uh, Star Phoenix. So um, I, I imagine you guys have already figured out what order you're going to go in, and being reporters and uh, media people, you probably know what questions you want to answer. I will uh, take the liberty of being, you know, here and being able to hog a mic sometimes to ask you questions, which I don't usually get the opportunity to do. Usually you're asking me questions, but um, I, I do want to say that um, it, without your role and the critical analysis that the three of you in particular have taken to your work and ensuring that it, you're not just reporting the greatest amount of information to um, and the least the le to the least informed on um, the greatest number of issues. In my experience, each of you has chosen to take on issues that at times are incredibly unpopular and that I know you've had to argue within your own organizations to cover stories that uh, are really important, that you know are important, and it's to our um, advantage that you've done that. We benefit from that in terms of being able to further those stories. So I want to thank each of you individually and as a group um, here and publicly um, for that role you play because I know it's not always easy and certainly women within the media have not always had an easy road to hoe, uh, but we're not here for that discussion, so that we'll save that for another day. Just, you know, feel like saying it. So um, I don't know who's going first, but I'll pass over to, to Larissa. Great. but um, I can speak up a little louder. <clears throat> my name is Larissa Burnoff, and uh, I actually began my career uh, here at the University of Saskatchewan. I did a few years doing criminal justice, Aboriginal justice and criminology, and uh, that kind of just led way into a weekend job at C95 here in Saskatoon, and I fell in love with radio, fell in love with broadcasting, and I took uh, Western Academy of Broadcasting here in Saskatoon and went up north to La Ronge where I started doing news, uh, radio news in La Ronge, uh, which turned into on-air personality in La Ronge, which one day, five years later, APTN National News came a-knocking and just said, hey, have you ever tried television? Let's fly you out to Winnipeg. They threw me in front of a camera and it stuck. So five and a half years later, here I am at APTN National News still. And um, I guess my tie to the criminal justice system is um, my father is the Aboriginal Program Director for Correctional Service of Canada for this entire region. So any of the healing lodges, any of the halfway houses, anything like that, my father is in charge of. So I've had my tie into the correctional justice system for years. When Willow Cree Healing Lodge was just opening up a few years back, um, he needed somebody to take minutes for the opening. So I went in there with my father and I did minutes as they brought in the elders. So I've had a tie into the justice system and a look at these healing lodges and these correctional systems for years. Um, my father was the warden out there for a little while. We did a stint in Prince Albert there for a little while. So I've had a chance to see really what happens really you know the over representation of aboriginal people in the criminal justice system which for me has had you know a wide eyed opening effect um, moving into television and covering just the aboriginal aspect in saskatchewan I travel the entire province covering news for the national news for APTN. And I've had, you know, I get to see all of the things that happen in these communities. And uh, 
we get to kind of pick and choose which stories we cover, and a lot of them, you know, do lead to justice. Um, just recently, we covered Evander Daniels earlier this week. He was a 22-month-old baby who had died in foster care, and we had spoken with Bob Pringle, and I speak with Bob Pringle, who's the children's advocate, on a, on a regular basis, and he always drives. You know, it's poverty that drives our child welfare system. It's poverty that, that drives the justice system, and it really is, because in a lot of our communities, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of of, you know inequalities and a lot of racism and discrimination on our reserves and we get to see firsthand what a lot of that does and how that affects our people and it's you know sometimes it's very hard and it's very heartbreaking in many occasions to you know go into these people's homes and be welcomed into these people's lives and have that opportunity to tell their story, whether it's a good story or whether it's a bad story. Um, I hate to put you on the spot, Sharon, but I've, I've covered Sharon's story a few times here, you know, and I was absolutely inspired finally getting to see someone who was part of that criminal justice system completely turn their life around and become this positive role model here. So, you know, it goes good with the bad and bad with the good. And uh, I'm sure these ladies can, you know, attest to that as well. But we're welcome to your questions if you have any questions. And uh, I'll pass it along because I could talk for days. So. <laughs> yeah, that's one of our drawbacks is we can't talk for days. So <laughs> we want to make sure we have enough time left to be able to engage and have, have discussions and, uh, and challenges from you as well. I'm Maureen Brosnan. I'm the national. I'm a national correspondent for CBC News, uh, both radio and television. Although my preferred medium is radio, and we do online now. We're all meshed into one in the new world order with uh, the uh, cutbacks at CBC. Um, I've worked right across this country. Uh, my I grew up in inner city Toronto. Came west on a dare for what was supposed to be a summer, and ended up spending 15 years in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. And I have to confess that Saskatchewan is still my favorite place. My best friends are still here, so any opportunity I have to come out and visit, thank you, Kim. <laughs> I first walked into a federal prison when I was 15 years old. It was P4W, and I was there with my class, my, my, school, my high school. We were there to play a con we were, were there to sing a concert for the women at P4W and have dinner with them afterwards, and it was an really impressionable experience that left with me. Little did I know at the time that I would spend, you know, 20 years of my career in and out of federal prisons after that, but it certainly did leave a, la a, lasting, uh, a lasting impression with me for that. I've spent a good chunk of my last, I guess, 20 years uh, working and doing stories within the prison system, and I'd like to start by reminding all of us that the prison system is a public system. Prisons are publicly funded institutions, no different than schools, hospitals, universities. But while any one of us can walk into a school or walk into a hospital or come onto this campus at U of S, we can't do the same in the prison systems. Despite the fact that we spend over $3 billion a year on the federal system, uh, we know very little about them. There is this, they are closed for the most part, they're hidden, they're dark and mysterious to most Canadians. Very few Canadians have ever been inside the walls or inside the fences. Uh, most of you here, because you're here, obviously have a different experience. But what people see and what they think of the prison system is often based on television shows, American television shows, which really are not a very realistic uh, view of, of what happens, especially here in Canada. So I guess I see my role uh, in covering the prison system as shining a light inside that in some ways, showing people what it's really like, you know, dispelling so many of the myths that, oh, it's a piece of cake, or as, uh, uh, as um, Cora Lee was mentioning earlier, you know, everybody's got, you know, full meals and steak and all this, nothing like that. It really is different. You know, when you start to sit and tell people that uh, uh, you can't, call in and talk to your loved one in a prison system. You can't call and reach somebody. They have to call you. They have to have your number approved. It has to go through a, a whole bureaucracy. Um, 
there are there are also so many myths about things like uh, uh, sentences. Oh well, they're out right away. They don't spend enough time. One of the things a few people remember is that in in this this country, life does mean life. If you you may get out on parole eventually, very few people make parole on their first parole eligibility date. We know that. Uh, I think the average time, and the last figures I've got, is is a lifer is in for at least 27, 28 years before they're getting parole now. Once you're out on parole, they have a chain like this that they can yank at any time. And it doesn't mean you have to, to uh, uh, commit a crime. It can be just a violation of you missed your curfew or you were found drinking a beer or something. That's enough to bring you back into the system for maybe three or four more years before you might get a chance, a chance to get out again. Very few Canadian people realize that. They hear, oh, well, he's got life 15. Well, no, it doesn't mean he's out in 15 years. It means that he's got a life sentence. But very few people realize those sorts of things. The difficulty in telling stories about the prison system is we all know here what makes a good story for news, what makes a good story for, for media is to put a personal face on it. It's really hard to tell stories about statistics, to take an academic paper and make people care about it. You really need to have the people in it. But it's very difficult to get to the people. Even if you know they're there, even if you, you want to reach them, there are so many restrictions of getting access to, to speak to, uh, to, to inmates. In, uh, and I can only speak mostly from the federal system. The provincial system varies across the country, but I know it's almost next to impossible to get into uh, a provincial jail in Ontario to do interviews these days as well. But the restrictions have come up so much more now. Um, it used to be 10 years ago I could call up and say, I'd like to meet with you know, Joe Smith, uh, he's agreed, you know, he wants to meet with me, you know, can we book it for next, you know, next week? I'd usually give them about a week's notice or so. Now you have to go through this whole bureaucracy, and then they'll turn you down for things like, uh, oh, you'll be in a, uh, it'll be too much of an interruption or a disruption to the institution for you to come in. Well, what's the difference with me or Betty Ann sitting in the visitor's area talking to somebody or even in the, the little lawyer's rooms that they have off to the side? Um, I'm, in my case, I'm just even bringing my tape recorder. I'm not bringing a camera or that. How is that a disruption? Then how is that any different than than somebody else coming in and visiting uh, visiting a loved one or a family member, uh, or a lawyer coming in for a visit? But they'll use that excuse. Then the other catch-all is it doesn't fit with the correctional plan. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, you mean having contact with outside people doesn't fit with the correctional plan? I thought the whole idea of rehabilitation is to allow people in the inside to have more contact with the outside, to have more exposure. But these are the kinds of barriers that are now being put up in front of us in a very meaningful way. Um, in one case recently, I'm been, I've been trying to get into see a fellow and that was the excuse they gave me doesn't fit with his correctional plan. The man is dying. He's got three months to live. He's got terminal cancer and it doesn't fit with his correctional plan, just doesn't kind of wash. But try going through the, the appeal processes to do that is very, very difficult. Um, I think the problem is that if you get in and you can put a human face and, and show and, and uh, uh, I guess, humanize the folks that are in there, because as, as, uh, as was said a bit earlier, I mean, that could easily be any one of us, any one of our relatives. You know, you don't need to go too far to find out someone who has a mental health problem that could easily run uh, amidst of the law and end up in the criminal justice system. Uh, an acquired brain injury that ends up uh, in, uh, in conflict with the law in some way and inside the system. You know, the, 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 but the problem is, is that if you humanize things, then all of a sudden the system can't demonize them anymore. And as long as you can keep people at a distance and pretend that they're all monsters, then all of a sudden society continues to say, oh, we've got to keep them locked away, they can't come out. But the fact is that sooner or later, everybody has a defined sentence for the most part, and they will get out and they'll be coming out. And if they haven't had contact or social skills or that to, to develop with the community, how, are, how is that going to keep us safer? How is that going to keep our community safer? And those are the things that are really difficult to get across. Um, uh, Kim mentioned a little bit about the fact that it's difficult to tell these stories. Um, I'm not sure about Larissa and Betty Ann, but there's a lot of resistance. There's a discomfort when you go to your editor and say, I've got a really good story I want to tell. Now, if it blows up totally, you know, they're interested in the Ashley Smith stories, 
But after a while, they get tired of them. We've had enough. We don't want you. Nah, do we have to go that again? Well, isn't there something interesting? Well, only if there's someone interesting testifying today do you go. So we get this resistance. There's a very short attention span. So you really have to be, in my case, rather strategic in telling a story. So for example, if I know there's a study coming out or I know there's an interesting uh, case coming up or something, you strategize, and I'll go to my, my assignment editor and say, have I got a really good story for you to run on Tuesday morning after the long weekend? Because you know there's no other news that day and they'll take anything. But if it's a way to get it on the agenda, you work around that way and find ways of getting the story in. Um, or you just try and find as much as a human angle to sell it. But even then, there's a discomfort. People don't want to know sometimes that the people they put in prison are human beings. You know, it's, it's easier to deal with it if you can keep them at a distance. Um, but I do believe, and I guess I wouldn't be sitting here doing this after this many years, that shining a light does force some degree of response, of accountability. I mean, it has happened. Uh, I guess the classic example was the P4W incidents going back, uh, I guess, uh, 20 years now almost, uh, from 1994 with the, uh, ex the, the extraction uh, team and the extraction of the women from those cells. If that hadn't shown up on, uh, on the Fifth Estate and the events leading from that and then the Arbor Commission, you know, what's to say that P4W wouldn't still be open now and we wouldn't have healing lodges across the country? So there are effects with that. Um, the uh, uh, Marlene Carter case that many of you are familiar with here in Saskatchewan uh, from last year. Uh, Betty Ann did a lot of work on it. I did work on it. The idea of bringing it out, and I mean, when I was reading through those, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of transcripts in, in her hearings for her dangerous offender, I mean, it was unbelievable, the tragic story. So how to bring that to light and show that, you know, someone who's, who, who the system is attempt to label as a dangerous offender is just, again, a human being whose circumstances just ended up in a terrible downward spiral uh, of which the system was, was a major culprit in that. Um, they just weren't able to handle her issues and her mental health concerns in the prison system. And time and time we hear that. The system acknowledges that. Oh yeah, we can't handle it. But there really has to be a push to do something more about it. And I think we can 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 help in that way. There's been many other uh, uh, other uh, cases across uh, the country over the years where there have been changes. Some of the early stories I remember doing, uh, you know, back 15, 20 years ago, were the treatment of uh, inmates in the federal system who had HIV, um, the discrimination they faced not just from other inmates, but also from the, uh, uh, the healthcare system, who didn't want to go near them. Um, there were a lot of changes after a couple of significant inquests uh, that brought things about. So there can be good things that happen, but it's a combination of, of holding feet to fire and trying to make things accountable. Personally, I guess I, what I'd like to say, I mean, we can get into all sorts of other things, but you know, I'd like to, to sort of say, you know, do we make a difference? I guess some days I rather get despairing and I look at it and say, oh, yeah, but we're doing the same stories we did 20 years ago. Why has nothing changed? But then I guess my, my little Pollyanna view of the world is, is that, you know, the mountain doesn't come over and come down overnight. You take a little pebble or two and once in a while, if you're lucky, there's a bit of a landslide, but eventually change does happen. And I guess I, uh, I always think back to, um, a situation a few years ago where I was sitting uh, at a dinner one night next to a um, Court of Appeal judge from Ontario and uh, she knew of my interest and my background in the prison system and we were chatting about it. And then she turned and said to me, what do you think history is going to think of us in about 200 years from now? And how we treated people in our, pr in our, in our correction systems, in our prison systems. They're going to think how inhumane was that society? How cruel was that? The same way that we look back now, three or four hundred years back, when people took those who had uh, mental disabilities and, and were criminals and took them out on the squares on Sunday and put them in stockyards and threw fruit and garbage and vegetables at them as the local entertainment. She said that's how she thinks that history may remember us for this period of time of what we are, what we are doing to the people we are incarcerating. And I thought, yeah, but isn't there something we can do in the meantime? And I'm thinking, you can sit that while you're sitting there on the Court of Appeal, but is it going to influence your decisions? I hope it does. I hope she shares that thought with her fellow judges. 
because I think, and I have to think that, that things will change slowly, but the work of all of you in this room is certainly helping in that end. And with that, Betty Ann, I'll throw it to you. <laughs> I was hoping I wouldn't have to go after Maureen because Maureen has pretty much covered everything off. But, but I'm, gonna I'll, I'm gonna jump off on some of the points that she made as well. And of course, I always, when I come to my job, I've been a reporter with the Star Phoenix for 20, almost 26 years. And um, the point that I always start from in my work is that we, as the media, represent the citizens in a democracy. This is our starting place. We live in a, a country represented by people that we chose from among our own ranks to serve us and to run our institutions on our behalf and we pay them to do it. And we as the media have a role in the whole system. We're one of the checks upon those who serve us. Are they doing what we as the people want them to do? Are they doing what we expect them to do? And do the policies of our government represent the feeling, the desires, the intentions of we the people? And I think that when we start from that point and we do our stories, what we're doing is we're examining the way our society is and so we're telling the citizens, we're giving, our job is to give the information to the citizens so that they can decide what they think of, they can make their own report cards about how the system is working. And then it's up to the citizens to decide whether or not things are being done the way they want them. And if they don't like it, it's up to the citizens to do something about it. So, when we look at doing our jobs, and, and I, I like that, and it is so true that when we're trying to do our jobs, we run into problems. And it, I know we have this heavy burden of responsibility, and I feel it all the time. But you, the new, there's, there's issues. There's issues that, that, are, that we have to overcome. And when you're working in a daily newspaper, there's the daily news cycle and there's the amount of space that you have to tell your story, and then, and then there's the job of doing it. So if we use the case of Marlene Carter as an example, and I think, prob is there anybody here who doesn't know who Marlene Carter is? Okay, just a brief thing. This is, this is an Aboriginal woman who has mental illness, and she has a compulsion to harm herself. She bangs her head continuously any chance she gets, so bad that she's caused herself brain damage. And Marlene Carter is a lot more than that. She's a human being. As a reporter, for me to find out who that human being is and to tell you more about her is, I've never been able to do it. I, I haven't been able to talk to her. I haven't been able to even, I don't need, I have, still haven't had, you know, the best I can do is to talk to her lawyer. And, and for them, or, or Kim, to, who can tell me their impressions. In any case, we try to tell these stories. And so when I started at the Star Phoenix 25 years ago, the warden of the Regional Psychiatric Center was called Peter Gunther. And he had these open houses every year, every second year for the media. And so we would all we'd go in there, he'd um, give us a little talk, tell us about the programming, how the system works, where it fits in the system, so we, we understood the system. And then he'd, they, his staff toured us around the facility. And we got to go up to the inmates and talk to them. We could write it down, we could record them. We could talk to the staff who were there. And in between, we all had Peter Gunther's phone number. We could phone him and we could ask him questions. Hey, some, somebody told us there was a hostage taking. Or hey, we heard that there was something, right? And then, and he'd talk to us about it. Well now, the process is a little different. Now, you phone, if you, if you have the nerve, if you're silly enough to waste your time actually calling the RPC, they say call this number. And so then it's not, it's not a phone number in the RPC, it's out at headquarters. And there you talk to a fella, he's a really pleasant man, and he's a brick wall. He's a very pleasant brick wall. He's pleasant up to a certain point, 
but then it turns into condescension. And so you ask him, you, you t tell him what you, for instance, yesterday, I called him. I called him because I wanted, what the point I wanted to make is that staff at the, at the facility can get fired if they talk. So I said, who can talk to the media? And he said, well, every facility has, a des has three designated spokespeople. They've been through all the training. And they work according to commissioners, um, the commissioner's directive number 23. And, um, and it goes through the rules, the terms of engagement. <clears throat> that was an interesting term, I thought, because terms of engagement, to me, suggests a war, <laughs> suggests uh, them against us. Excuse, wait, okay, and just remembering that these are our public servants who are operating our publicly owned institution. These are representatives of the state to whom we have given special powers to take the liberty of our fellow citizens. They work for us. But when I ask them, what happens if, what happens if people who, beyond those three designated people, don't uh, come and speak to the media? He said, oh, well, it would de depend on a, a min wide factor of things, many, many, list of things. And I said, well, for instance, say, say I phone and someone tells me something. He says, well, it, it depends. Like, did you ask them what time of day it was? I said, I said well, are you, what, what can possibly happen to a person? They sign a non-disclosure a, a non, a non uh, agreement when they start working there. You know, what, what's the worst that can happen? Because I don't know, could they be charged with some kind of a criminal offense or something? And so he uh, emailed me, sent me several emails throughout the day, all of them with links to government policy documents. <laughs> and so he didn't, I can tell you right now that people will be fired if they talk. But he didn't tell me that. He sent me links to pages and pages and pages of policy where I can go and find out for myself. And, and, and one of the questions was, what happens to people after they work there, employees who've retired or left? What if they tell us what happened when they were working there? Mmm, I'll have to work on that. And by the end of yesterday, he hadn't been able to get me an answer on that. So I don't know, maybe he just couldn't find it in the policies, and he couldn't find anybody in his office or anybody who actually knew the answer. They weren't... So, so this is the kind of thing that we run into when we're trying to inform our fellow citizens about what's going on. The, the communications staff, and this is happening, of course, as you probably are aware, throughout the federal government and it's seeped down into every layer of government. The same thing is happening now, in, of course, in the provincial government, the city of Saskatoon. I mean, you can no longer phone the mayor because now he has his you know, $80,000 a year communications dude who's by his side and decides whether or not the mayor can talk. <laughs> so it, it, it's like that everywhere. And so now we're trying to tell a story, but how do we do that? How do we fulfill our duty to you to let you know as a citizen what's going on inside your public, publicly owned prison? And of course, how do we do that? It's become increasingly difficult. And one of the things that's kind of sad is that they, all of those institutions can pay their communication staff whatever they want. Newspapers are privately held, pub, private businesses, and we are bleeding. We are bleeding red. We can't sell advertising anymore, and that is what pays for newspaper reporters' wages. We don't, all of the advertising disappeared to Kijiji and Craigslist. And you go to, you look at your newspaper and look how thin it is some days, and it's because we don't have the money to hire as many people and have as big an operation as we used to. Newsrooms across the, not just in, in Canada, but in the United States, Denver closed down, it doesn't have a daily paper anymore, they've only got the online edition, like they're trying to save money. There's so little money. And so, of course, what happens is reporters working in, in an environment where they're, and I don't, don't mean to be self-serving and complain, I'm just trying to explain what the situation is, that reporters are leaving the business, and you know who will pay them for their skills at gathering information and writing and communicating? 
communications departments. The, my friendly brick wall at communications has a journalism degree. That of so many of my colleagues in the 25 years that I've worked there, of the colleagues that have left, some have gone on to great careers with the Globe and Mail and the CBC and, and other wonderful organizations, but the great majority have left our work when I'm calling institutions, whether it's jails, whether it's schools, whether it's um, City Hall, you know, former CTV is in charge of the communications, if it's a health region, Three or four reporters, former former reporters, run the communications at City Hospital. Over at, heaven forbid, Cameco, where they've got lots and lots of money and they can really pay their communications people. Five or six former Star Phoenix reporters work there. And so what you've got are the really good, highly paid reporters who know how it works. They've become the gatekeepers of the information. And their jobs are to are to, I think, the, I forget what, how Kim put it, but she talked about, um, she talked about um, the, the I, I wrote it down somewhere, but I'm never gonna find it in my mess. She talked about just this um, covering there, covering when, 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 you, when it's more punishment, the job of the institution becomes to protect itself, to cover its butt, and so, when we're talking about corrections, they, they, don't, they don't want us to know what's going on inside there because if they are scrutinized, then they have to be held accountable. And so they try not to be scrutinized. And so when we're trying to cover a story, we don't get the institution's point of view, we don't get the point of view of the people who work there or the people who are prisoners there. What we're, we're lucky when we have an advocate who will come forward and speak on behalf of a prisoner, a lawyer who will come forward and speak on behalf of a prisoner, maybe family members. Obviously, we've seen those people here today. They'll come and speak on behalf of the prisoners. But when our only story, when our story only presents one side, what do you have? You have unba unbalanced, biased journalism. That's poor journalism. That's not the kind of work we want to do, but what are our choices? And so, I, so in, in talking about Marlene Carter, I called, you know, of course, I called my friend, the brick wall over at the, at the communications. And so, you know what he said to me? So first of all, of course, he can't talk because it's still before the courts and he can't talk. And here's how it's before the courts. She'd already had her dangerous offender hearing and we were waiting for the decision of the judge. So it wouldn't have mattered what anybody said about the case. Judge Whalen wasn't gonna be influenced by, by what she read in the paper. She already had her, so that was one of their reasons for not putting forward a spokesperson. And the other was because of the prisoner's privacy. And that is, privacy law, it has become a wonderful, wonderful shield for communications directors everywhere to prevent people knowing what's going on within social services, within healthcare, within justice, within communications wonderful privacy rules have become the shield behind which they hide. And so, so what I get from him is that inmates with mental health care needs receive intensive interdisciplinary treatment in safe and supportive environments. That was what I got for the entire story about Car Marlene Carter. That's what the, the system gave us. And so then I just followed that up with a quote from Howard Sapers our watchdog for prisons who we don't know, they're looking for his replacement, they've decided that he's given enough negative critical reports and they're gonna find someone else to do his job. But in his uh, 2011 report on, on uh, inmates who self-harm, he said that within CSC, and so this is in direct contrast to what, uh, to what Brickwall said, within CSC, the management of self-injury tends to elicit a security or punitive response, namely containment, isolation, seclusion, and segregation. Such responses tend to exacerbate the frequency and severity of self-injury or escalate the resort to other resistive or combative behaviors. So, This is, this is, and I've taken up a lot of time, but this is the sort of things that we are 
facing as we try to fulfill our duty to inform our fellow citizens about what's going on. And so we will continue to do our best with, in, with the constraints of shrinking newsrooms and with the, in the constraints of the daily news cycle. And for me, I hope that we can get that there are enough citizens in our Canadian democracy who will make it clear to their governments to make it clear that they give a damn, that they want to know what's going on in their institutions. It, because government will keep do, following its own agenda until the people lead. And I know that sounds like, uh, you know, revolutionary, but truly, until people let government know what they really want, the government will just follow its own agenda, and we know where that's leading. Um, I want to, just before I open up the question and see, I'm such a, like, a pain in the butt hoggy chair, right? So you can all tell me to get lost. But I, um, something you said, um, Betty Ann, in particular, made me, um, in addition to standing up because I want to thank you, um, say that I, one of the challenges that I see, that we've seen, and uh, Maureen raised the P4W situation, and one of the challenges we had was that whole issue of lack of access has meant that whenever Corrections does speak, they're often given priority position, not by you guys, but by m the majority of the media. And one of the challenges that we, we pose when we're, um, you know, whether it's law students or the public or anybody, is I'll often encourage people, and I encourage, you know, I'd be interested in your comments on this, to always think, who benefits from the perspective I'm being asked to believe here? And when you think about, um, you know, and I think of how hard it was to get the information about what happened at P4W, it's, it's easier now for us to get an audience partly because, um, and I'd be interested in your comments on this, I mean, when I come forward, most people know that I've usually checked out the law, I've checked out the policy, I've even checked out stuff with corrections. And so um, that's different from when I first went to the media about the April 94 situation where corrections had said to me, um, you didn't see what you saw. They actually knew I had seen things, but they said I didn't see them. And then they went about a campaign of um, encouraging people to believe that I had either mental health issues or was delusional or a con lover or all of the above. And that stalled that story getting out. And the only way to get it out in the end, um, and, I, and it wasn't just that issue, but there were other issues, was to actually get the video released because Corrections had done such a good job of papering over with policy and their re uh, rhetoric, really, about what had happened that it was really difficult to get the story out. And so I'm, I'm curious as to when you're doing it, how, what's the test you do? I mean, my test is who benefits from this perspective? Um, I don't know if there's a, a, a similar sort of test that a media has. Not that I'm going to try and use it to get you to do the stories I want or anything, but just to be transparent. I, I can start and, and just give a couple of points on that. But first of all, one of the, the difficulties in doing uh, stories uh, uh, on corrections is the credibility factor. Right out there, you know, you're starting below zero because people say, well, they're, you know, they're convicts. You're not going to believe them. Why not? So that normally uh, when we do a story, if we're doing sources, it's two sources, you know, and credible sources. We have to go twice. I go twice the distance on that. If I get a report on something, I have to check it out three or four times. You know, get two or three other sources to confirm it before before I will go with it. That way, when I go to my, my, uh, my editors, I can say, I have confirmed this. I've got this three or four different ways. So we really have to go the extra distance on that. Um, the other thing is, is, is just gaining access. I mean, many times, uh, all of you can be a very good help to us. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of fortunate. I have quite a few contacts. And there's a, the last time, actually, a deputy commissioner tried to challenge the fact and wrote a letter to the president of CBC complaining that did he know that I was on 150 pin lists of inmates across this country? And wasn't that atrocious that, that, uh, that you know, I should have all these people? And I turned around and looked and said, hell, there's 15,000 inmates in the system. If I'm only on 150, I'm not doing so good. 
Um, but I mean, they, they looked upon that as saying, you know, there's, there's something, you know, she's obviously, uh, you know, there's something wrong with her if, if she talks to these many inmates. But, but that's the kind of a source that I've been able to build up that I can check with that. And usually what I do is I'll call family members and say, you know, can you have your, you know, can you have your brother or can you have your father give me a call? Because I know they're on the pin list and they can get to me and I can check these things out. Um, and, you know, some of the things are, are really difficult. Like, for example, and I don't think I can, I mean, Betty Ann, if you can take this and run with it, but there was a, a really horrific self-injury case uh, about three weeks ago at uh, Sass Penn. A fellow who was in segregation um, cut off his nose and flushed it down the toilet. I mean, it's, it's a horrible thing. And, uh, and a fellow who knew about it and said, Maureen, they didn't even send him to RPC. They didn't send him anywhere. They put him back in SEG. Is that right? You know, uh, but trying to verify that you can't just run with that story without checking it out. It turns out it is true, um, and I'm not. I haven't been able to work further on to find out whether there's more to it. But I mean, those are the kinds of things you know that that. Though, I mean, they're horrific things, but this is the kind of stuff that's going on inside. These are the kinds of things that, you know, lead to terrible self-harm, the Marlene Carter stories, that, you know, need to get out there so people can see them. But they are difficult to scratch away at. And, uh, and you know, Kim, you're right. It is a matter of, think. there's a lot of critical thinking that has to go on here. It's saying, who benefits? Um, another thing that comes up, the Canoe James uh, inquest that, uh, that Kim mentioned that should be starting fairly soon. One of the interesting things is, of course, is that uh, uh, for those of you who may not know the case, Canoe James uh, was uh, in Grand Valley and was then transferred. She's originally from, from Winnipeg, uh, was transferred back to, uh, or was transferred to RPC. And uh, as, it, as the story as we know it at this point, you know, had been pushed on her, uh, on her call bell several times because she was, she was experiencing chest pains and the call bell was ignored and she was found dead in her cell, and uh, there's all sorts of uh, questions about that. But there's another backstory before that that some of you may not know, which is that Canoe James contacted us uh, about four months earlier to tell us about problems at Grand Valley with a senior prison official who was uh, sexually abusing some of the inmates and uh, had... Uh, uh, had been quietly disciplined or there'd been some investigation and all this and um, and we ran a story on that and uh, Canoe James shortly after that was transferred out of Grand Valley now how much does that play into what may happen will that come up at the inquest I don't know it remains to be seen <laughs> okay but I mean these are the kinds of things that are going on that they try to keep a lid on I'm not saying, you know, that the whole system is, is, is corrupt or wrong. There are some very good caring people in that. And if it weren't for some of those caring people calling us, you know, quietly, they know they can't talk, they know they're going to get in trouble, but we do have some people who are genuinely concerned about what's going on and are trying to get the word out. But the, the, the policies of, of, of keeping a lid on everything are really, really, really challenging. I can add to that. We, when we covered the Canoe James thing, and uh, it came to Saskatoon, they said, you know, Larissa, we need to get you to RPC. And because my father, who is Correctional Service of Canada, I tried to get my foot in there, you know what, I said, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna get rid of the brick wall, and I'm gonna go straight to the, the man in charge. And I said, Dad, who do I need to talk to? And he said, I can't talk. He said, I'm sorry. He said, you know you can't call me if it comes, you can call me for anything, but you can't call me for that. So who did I get sent to was the brick wall. And what did I get from the brick wall? Same thing that Betty had and when she said, I got link after link after link. Make sure you go through this. Make sure you go through this, Lola. You got to go through this. I got nothing from RPC when it came to Kenny James's case. We had to go with what we had from everyone else. As soon as those videos were released, we still did get nothing from RPC. And it kind of sucks because at the end of the day, when I go home for dinner, it was a really quiet supper that night. You know, so at the end of the day, I can't really go home and say, hey, Dad, guess what I did at work today? No, I can't, you know? We talk about the kids, we talk about the grandkids and things like that. But when it comes down to work at the end of the day, I can't really say anything to him until, you know, something positive comes up. We were covering the straight up program with these gang members. And I had a gang member come to me and say, you know what, if it wasn't for your dad and those programs that he put in place at the Healing Lodge, I wouldn't be out of prison. I'd still be in there. So there are some positive things, 
But like she said, those loopholes, when I was trying to cover the story about uh, the anniversary of John Martin Crawford, he killed a bunch of Aboriginal women here, prostitutes, got away with it. When we did the, when we covered that case, and when we came back to look at it 20 years later to see what has changed, I got the same brick wall. I said, I wanna take my camera in there, and I wanna talk to John Martin Crawford. Well, you know, we can't really send people in there. You know, are you sure you want to go? And then who did it? No, 20 minutes later, I skipped daddy. I got a call from daddy saying, I heard you were digging around. So, you know, there is a lot of stuff going on in and out of there. And daddy's probably going to get mad at me for that. But, um, you know, there is a lot of loopholes and a lot of things that we face trying to cover those stories. And I said, you know what? 20 years later, I could walk out onto the street right now and ask somebody, who's Kalinda Waterhen? No one would know who she was. She was one of John Martin Crawford's victims. I can go out and ask you right now, who's, you know, all of these other victims that Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo killed, and everyone will know. You know, and it's something that we face, and we wanted to raise that issue 20 years later. Why are Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka victims more important than the women here in Saskatoon that were found just by Moon Lake Golf Course? And you know what? The majority, 90% of Saskatoon won't know, and the 10% that do know are Aboriginal people who go to these missing and murdered women's walks, who go, who, you know, are in that scene. And you know what, 20 years later, I still have, I still can't get anything from RPC or anybody to talk about these stories. And you know, we wanted to do the anniversary, but you know what, it's, it is, it's literally talking to a brick wall. I don't know, Betty Ann. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to mention uh, about about uh, the inability to get information is that, it, and, and this business about how we're left with one-sided stories, of course, is that that's not good journalism and it gives more reason for the prisons to say we don't trust the media because they don't give, they don't give a false picture. And, but what, what also happens is that it's not fair to the people who work in the prisons because there are, I mean, in the story of Marlene Carter, we know that her experience was bad. But what we didn't, but what doesn't come out until the, you're in court, if, you're, if you get to, if you have, if your organization has the time and resources to free you up to sit through the days and days and days of dangerous offender hearings, you will hear the voices of staff. And these are, the, the, thank goodness for the court system, because this is the only place where the gag is removed from the mouths of the staff within the prison systems, within the, within the jails, within the police detention. Now they can talk, they're under oath, and the court says, speak your truth. And then we hear about the, the workers who are there. We're talking about many well-meaning, well-educated, compassionate psychiatric nurses, guards, all kinds of staff, therapists, there, and I'm not saying, because we know there are, there are such people, but they're working in a system that is also overburdened, underfunded, understaffed. They don't get to tell, they don't get to talk about that in an interview when, we, when an incident happens. It's months later when we are picking over the bones in an inquest or, or waiting to find out if a person who threw a cup of water at someone is going to be declared a dangerous offender. Well, so those people also lose because they are working in that institution with those people and they are burning out and they would, you know what, they'd like to see the story of Carly, Marlene Carter saying that Marlene Carter had people who treated her as best they could. They, for whatever reasons, they couldn't, they couldn't solve her problems, but there were a lot of people who tried. And we know from talking to Marlene's lawyers that after she was successfully transferred to th this mental hospital in Brockville, Ontario, that among the people she called when she had the freedom to call people were the people, the staff at the RPC whom she considered her friends. Now, when RPC won't let us talk to the people there, we do a disservice to our, to our fellow citizens who are public service there and who are spending their careers doing the best they can. And so, so the good and the bad 
are hidden behind that shield. And we, the media, have difficulty showing those nuances. It's not a black and white picture. Nothing ever is. And if you're a journalist and your story is a really hard hitting all black and, no, and here's the good guys and here's the bad guys, then you haven't finished your research because life's not that simple. It's not that tidy, it's not that neat. It's shades of gray. And that's complex. That's complex, it takes time to explain. And when you have, when you have talking points that, that are, you know, if, 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 if government is, is making you think that the people inside are people to be feared and that the best thing is to lock them up, they're bad guys, they need to be in jail, that's simple and easy, and you shouldn't be fooled. <laughs> that you wrote, not about the story so much, but about the reaction, where the reaction was a, a surprise to you or a shock to you. Go ahead. I'm, I, like, I, I'm just still trying to... Like criminal justice-wise reaction or public-wise reaction? Either. Like, a reaction, obviously related to yeah. the topic, but a, a reaction where it was, you didn't expect what you got. Okay. Uh, There's a story I did probably a little over 15 years ago now that uh, still affects me quite deeply. Um, it was around the time where uh, we were just looking at the treatment of uh, uh, prisoners in the system with AIDS and HIV, and uh, there was a, a group at a uh, group of of, um, of lifers at Joyceville that were. Uh, very, uh, very progressive, and they had the support of doctors. They were putting together videos of harm reduction. It was fairly controversial. And that's when the first studies came out that showed the prevalence of HIV among prisoners and hep C, which uh, was, was quite astounding, like 17, 18 times the, nor the rate on the outside. Uh, hep C was like 25, 30%, it's higher now. Um, but these were, these were pretty astounding things, and uh, there was no methadone, regular methadone in the system at that point. Um, those very brave inmates that spoke out and talked about this and talked about how they'd started a peer counseling uh, system, this is in the early days of all this. Um, we did a pretty intensive job of that uh, um, back then and the story's got a lot of, a lot of attention. One of, the, um, one of the, uh, the, the men who spoke out on it was a fellow by the name of Lawrence Stalking. As a result of that, uh, he ended up getting transferred to maximum security. Uh, security was, up, was raised up. There was a controversy, there was an allegation he was muscling and something like that. But anyway, it was an excuse to move him up to, uh, to um, maximum security. And he had been in about 15 years, I guess, at that time. He was just about ready to apply for his uh, uh, um, faint hope clause, which we still had at that time. And uh, this was really going to seriously affect, affect things. Three months later, he was found dead in his cell, uh, allegedly from uh, an overdose, a heroin overdose. Um, it was always highly suspicious. And uh, I had to live with the fact that it's probably because of my stories that he ended up getting, tr getting maxed, because the fact is, is I have to tell each of these people when I talk to them every time, just because you talk to me, it's not gonna make anything better. We're not gonna, it's not gonna necessarily solve your problem. I can't protect you from repercussions. I can try and stay on top of it and, and let people know what's happening, but you are a captive in that system and I have to make sure that they are aware of the risk that they take with that. And I think, you know, back then, I guess I was just still naive enough to think that there weren't that kind of repercussions. So um, in some ways that's kind of inspired me to stick with it and, and be with it over the years, but, but that's one of the ones that still haunts me today. I, I don't know, I, I can't to say, I can't think of a case when I was really surprised by the response. I mean, it's, it's always nice when you get some feedback. And, um, but I don't know, I don't know if we're changing. I don't know if, if it's hard to know if the work you do um, 
resonates, if it goes out and, and if it leads people, if it leads to public change, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, for example, when we, when we worked with the media on the Judy Bellotta story, I was surprised at the degree to which it exploded across the country. Because to us, it was just an extreme end of a continuum that we see every day. So I was actually quite shocked at the degree of public support for Julie and her baby, the woman that had given birth inside the jail and had reached birth with absolutely no support and NSX help. Um, I was surprised and, and it was a reminder to me, I guess, that I've been conditioned, you know, by the system because it just, I knew the story had to be told, but I was surprised at the reaction we got. I can just add quickly in that, I think you hit the nail on the head, Brianna, because the trick there is, is that it was a very personal story. It was a story that people could relate to. A mother in labor in, in, a, in, a, in a cell where she was not getting any attention. I mean, that, that, that hits home with people and that's where you can make the difference. And of course, well, I'll get your question. And of course it re requires that we be informed, that we in the media know that these things are happening. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of courage for people who know they can lose their job to come forward and tell us about the things that they see going on inside. And, and uh, we, we depend on that. One of the things that um, I noticed when I was covering a story, um, because I have ties to Northern Saskatchewan, the Bobal Isle Cross area is kind of where I'm from, we had always grown up knowing that there were these town drunks. You know, every community has them. They're the guys that are a part of every weekend. You find them sitting outside the liquor store asking for money. Never ever thought anything into it until the trial of Paul LaRue came around. Now, Paul LaRue is a 73-year-old man who's already once pled guilty and was convicted of molesting and raping young boys at the Inuvik uh, residential school during the 70s. These boys finally came forward years later and finally admitted that Paul LaRue was molesting and raping them at the Beauval Indian Residential School during the 60s, before he even went to Inuvik. And you know, it comes into light what happened to them and why they are the way they are. I sat through that trial every day, and because it was his legal right to represent himself in court, Paul LaRue had the opportunity to cross-examine every single boy that was his victim. So sometimes the justice system is, you know, it works against us. These boys cried on, well, these men now, cried on the stand as Paul LaRue was in their face saying, you know I didn't touch you. You know I didn't do that. You know it. And I couldn't actually believe that this is Canadian law. He was allowed to do this. Not only did that go through the whole trial process, everything, the identities of these victims were saved. We come around to sentencing. Paul LaRue got three years. He got three years for molesting eight boys. There was 14 in total, but he only got found guilty of eight. Now, comes around, we sit outside the courthouse, these victims are crying in the arms of their wives, in the arms of their children, who grew up with a life as a father who was a drunk because of everything he went through. He got three years, he was out in less than a year for good behavior. He served 12 months for raping those boys. I was actually surprised and shocked that nobody cared, that there wasn't a national outcry. Because these victims, why? Maybe it was because they were Aboriginal. Maybe it was because they were the town drunk and nobody cared about them. If those were 15 white boys, society would have, there would have been an outrage. This man would have never seen the light of day. He finally got thrown back in prison because of appeal. Thank God he's back in jail now. However, what shocked me the most was that because these little boys came back all these years later, this convicted pedophile, twice convicted pedophile, walked free less than 12 months after serving a sentence for raping young children. And then moving on to the next is an Indian residential school, raping more of them. That was one of the things that I was so absolutely shocked. Like, why wasn't my phone blowing up off the hook from angry citizens of the city, angry citizens of the north? Nobody cared. So there's kind of, you know, it kind of goes back and forth where you see things like that happen. Sorry, go ahead, you've been kind of. I, I've got so many things I have. <laughs> uh, I, I teach in a junior college, university, mm -hmm. in the top world. And, you know, we've got a world full of media 
24 hour media, so much news, nothing's new. Mm -hmm. My students are totally eager. Mm -hmm. Out of 35 students in class coming to the criminal justice, and I'll say, how many of you people have heard of Picton? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's two or three hands go up. So I bring the media to class, no <coughs> one won't understand that. Mm -hmm. Number two, we need more people. I'm really concerned about, it seems like you people are starting moving to a state controlled media. Absolutely. What are you going to do about that? We've got our federal government's muzzling our scientists who are not allowed to speak. Some of you're not allowed to speak. I think you've got a hell of a story. Why don't you tell the community that story to frustrate just the way you presented it here this morning? You know, I thought that was a great story. Well, it, I mean, the thing is, there's a certain um, reluctance to do things that we, the media, see as self-serving. I mean, or that we might be accused of being self-serving. I, I mean, it's the kind of thing I think that, that could be the subject of a column. It's, it's you, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, um, But we didn't have to have anything to do with offenders. No. Yeah. It's just that whole idea that we have social institutions out there that you people do not have the right to access. Well, that, that, I mean, I, I'm like you, I get really yeah. angry. I'm sitting here saying, why are Canadians angry about the muslin of our scientists in Canada? Why are they? Another thing that I worry about as an instructor in criminal justice is sometimes the headlines. And I would encourage you people to pay more attention to your headlines, because I think a lot of cases that's all the community reads. And I, I see it sometimes where man convicted of murder gets 10 years. Man, I phone the media rep, because I know right away that's impossible. If he's convicted of murder, he's got life. What they're talking about is their PD day. But the public doesn't know that. So media people have to, I would say, pay attention to your headlines. Because it's really misleading. And I have the public say, hey, that guy just got 10 years. So I said, no, he didn't. Do you write your headlines? No, no we don't. Mom. Um, um, no, we don't write the headlines for one thing. And the second thing is, yes. is that in the in the interest of just being really short, that's what often happens. But there's an ignorance in many of the media too that don't realize the difference between parole eligibility and and a life sentence. Yeah. It's it's different because um, with where we do television, we have a separate web guy who will take our story right from the anchor's computer that we write and kind of turn it into our own thing and say, hey, is this correct? And then throw it on the web. So sometimes we have absolutely zero control of what goes on to the website and what our headlines are. So it varies. Cor Coralie, did you have something you want to say? Yeah. Drugs in prison? Drugs. 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 walk in the gate with their lunch pails and their jackets and their, how do, I wonder how drugs get in there if the visitor aren't bringing it. Absolutely, I'm, and I mean, I'm not saying that everybody, that every, I mean, clearly, I'm saying there's shades of gray and everything's on a spectrum, and I believe there are well-meaning people in prisons, but absolutely, yeah. we know that, we know that there, that Another drugs get in. Job trumps humanity and human life. Not one of them is going to stand up. One stood up in my case. She was ostracized. She was fired Christmas Eve. So, black and white, yeah, I believe there's black and white, and I believe there's a lot of black and white mingle in with the white and form a little gray there in the middle. <coughs> but it's an old boys school, and they're doing what they're told instead of doing what's right. Well, absolutely. I think that, that people, I mean, we're kind of cogs in a system, aren't we? You know, and, and individuals. No, uh, you're not cogs in a That staff is not cogs. If they're great big men, making $80,000 a year, thereabouts, that's about their average wage. Great big, strong, sturdy men. They're too busy buying trucks and having camps and being Mr. Big Chuck, carrying their gun off duty. They're too, they're, they're not all white. 
perfect little people that are in there. They're not. Else, if they had any, any kind of conscience, they would have stood up and said, that's what happened. I was there, I saw it. They don't. They say, oh, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know who told me that, but, you know, they were doing it. The manager said do it, and so, yeah, that's what we're doing. I think that it, it almost falls into, you know, not only the justice system, but, you know, other fields as well. Um, you know, I see that in politics every day, every day, especially, you know, here in Saskatchewan, Aboriginal politics. Sometimes, sometimes they are. I've been actually chased off, physically chased off of a reserve by goons at the order of the chief because he didn't want me covering... He didn't want me there, exactly. So it, go, it goes back and forth. So I think it happens in a lot of fields and a lot of people, you know, we can't, we can't tell them how to do their jobs. You know, we can't tell them, you know, right from wrong. I guess we just kind of hope. Coralie, you're, no, you, yeah. you do, you have a very strong point yeah. and it's true because what often happens is people, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are a lot of people, you know, that get, that, I never would have expected the things that I've learned in the last seven years. I didn't know that was happening here. I expected that to be in Iran or somewhere else yeah. where they have whipped it. Absolutely. No, it's true. And what happens is a lot of people hide behind that system. You and I heard that at the inquest, and everyone else yeah. did as well. Yeah. And I think the point that, you know, I'm prob I think that part of what gets frustrating probably is those of us who have been through those processes many times is. And you're right that in when Marlene Carter's story was being told, staff t t said what they tried to do. But I think the point is is valid that they they say it once there's a death and once they're under those pressures. And we don't often. I mean, we do. I I do sometimes see people doing things that are they're trying to get something exposed, but it's precious little and sometimes far too late. And so I think those that's an important point. I don't I hate cutting off because it's clear there's interest and but it's also clear we're 15 minutes into the lunch time. Um, so I just want to thank you um, all three of you once again. Thank all of you for the dialogue. And I have here as gifts for you for um, for joining us um, a human rights in action manual. So if you're ever wondering what the law is supposed to be um, the law students and um, many of lifers have worked on this, and so it's a handbook that basically is 12 foot of um, law and policy, so you can have a quick handy dandy, and also Yvonne Johnson's book. So. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.